Uh, today we have Dr. Stephen Jett, who will be uh, our speaker today. Uh, I got to meet him in Germany. Uh, when I took a team over there in uh, 2010 was my first opportunity. And I can tell you there are those men in your life that make great impacts. Most of the time that's a father or a grandfather. But this is one of those men that have made a tremendous impact in the life of me, my wife, and my family. And I am so grateful, Stephen, that you're here today to, to speak. Let me just give you a little bit of a background about Stephen. He is a, a Knoxville native, so go Vols. Um, from, uh, graduated from South Doyle High School. He also went to Southwestern uh, Seminary. He then went to the Oxford Graduate School. And then from there, God called him to, I, to the IMB, and he was a missionary for 25 years in Germany throughout the whole different country. I met him in Brühl, Germany. It's a little town between Bonn and Cologne. He also taught in the seminary over there in, in Bonn. After leaving and retiring from the IMB, God didn't let him retire. He's come back now to Kentucky, where he's the DOM of the South Union Mount Zion Association. And so, Stephen, after we have our time of worship, we look forward to the message that God has for each one of us. I think uh, Spencer's going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll uh, enter a time of worship. Hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Uh, we're so grateful to be here in chapel today. Um, of course, we want to remember all the prayer requests on our hearts, specifically the Bread of Life mission, um, and just remember all of us and the new students as we uh, continue on in this new school year. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day, for your grace, which you have given us. We thank you, Lord, again, for the opportunity to worship, to gather in chapel, for this wonderful place called Clear Creek. We thank you so much just for everybody here, for our leadership and for those willing to deliver your word. We pray for this time of worship. Please just align our hearts to you, God. And may we hear your word. Please just be with our brother, Lord. Please speak through him. Give him your words, God. And may it all be for your glory. May we be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and we'll sing. We'll start out with nothing but the blood.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that Thank you for your call that brought us here to Clear Creek. I um, just thank you for your presence here with us today. And then I ask you to be with our speaker. I ask that uh, you would be with him as he opens up your word and presents to us a message that you have given him. Um, help us to receive what has been given and help us to apply it to our lives. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for bringing us here. In your name, amen. Well, it's a great opportunity for me to be here today. Uh, I have loved you from afar. I heard so much about this school, and I'm grateful to God that I have the opportunity to be with you today. 
Uh, you are a school on the move, I can see it. There's renovation going on, and uh, I know that God is doing some great things here in your life, especially in your journey uh, with Him as you serve Him, as you study, and I'm thankful that God has allowed me to be here. I'm amazed at what God uh, does with country folks from out in the county uh, and sends us around the world to do all kinds of things. I guess that's because he wants to show how great he is. And uh, um, my wife and I have been married in October. It will be 40 years. When my friends hear that, uh, that know both of us, they congratulate me and send her a card of condolences. <laughs> but I'm just so glad to be here. And I, I thank God uh, for schools like this that help us to sharpen the tools that God has placed in our life in order to preach the gospel and to do it effectively. And I hope you'll grab everything you can get while you're here uh, because, trust me, it'll help you. And uh, even those uh, classes that you think are teaching you things that you won't use practically, you will. You'll be glad you have them. So thank you for letting me be here today. Um, there's a story that was told uh, about a news conference in San Francisco City Hospital. Uh, Mr. David Bloom's son had a, had a rat by the name of Vermin. And Vermin was really active. And uh, so he would get out as often as he could whenever the cage was left open. And uh, one morning it turned into disaster because... When he got out, he ran from uh, Mr. Bloom's son's bedroom through the kitchen, through the open door into the closet, uh, into the garage, past the closet into the garage, and uh, he found a dark tunnel to get in to hide, and it happened to be the tailpipe to Mr. Bloom's motorcycle. Well, Mr. Bloom went out there trying to get that rat to come out of there. He said he even held food on a string down in front of the end of that tailpipe, but he said that rat said nothing doing. And so uh, he thought, I I'll do everything I can. Finally, he got down in front of the tailpipe and lit a match hoping that the light would draw the rat out of that uh, tailpipe. Unfortunately, there was a trapped... Uh, area of gasoline there and it exploded and a flame came out and it got Mr. Bloom's mustache and uh, burned it off and gave him uh, second degree burns on his face. Well, that wasn't all. Unfortunately, the flame also got the uh, fur of the rat on fire and it burned off his uh, whiskers and there was another trapped pocket of gas up further into that tailpipe. And so <laughs> it ignited and an explosion took place and that rat came out of there like a cannonball would come out of the end of a cannon. It hit Mr. Bloom right in the face, breaking his nose. And they reported that after Mr. Bloom was released from the hospital, his son uh, had to stay home under house arrest for six weeks. Well, it can be dangerous when things get in disarray, when we have some things that have gone in a direction they should not go. And it's interesting for us to peruse the Scripture and to read them and to find out what God has to say about us in our relationship to Him. And so we don't want things to go awry. We want to give God the very first place in our life, don't we? Uh, that's the place He deserves, the only place He deserves, to give God first place. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn to Genesis chapter 2. How can you know if God has first place in your life? Many people would say, well, Stephen, you're preaching to the choir. You are at a school of theology. You're at a Bible school. Certainly, these people know what it means. That's the case most I have found in my God to truly have God in the place He belongs in our life. Amen? 
So I want to encourage you as you study, as you go about your ministry and your work and when you're at home, whether you're driving in your car, whatever it is, that God has first place in your life. If you will, stand together with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or test Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together." And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. <clears throat> and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. O oh God, we pray that you would bless this reading of your word. Father, help us to obey, to apply what you say to us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. First place is a wonderful thing. We, I hope you've been watching some of the Olympics uh, uh, during the time that you are studying. Perhaps you haven't watched as much of it as you could have. But it's a wonderful thing to see how much people are willing to sacrifice and give years of their life in order to get first place. First place is special, right? And uh, that preeminent position in our lives should belong to God. We know that in the Old Testament we are taught over and over that it is God who deserves the very best. He deserves to be seen as He truly is, to worship him as he is in spirit and in truth, 
means to see Him as the God beside whom there is none other. He is the only God that we are to serve. And He deserves first place. In the Old Testament, when the sacrifices were to be brought, they were to be brought without spot and blemish. They were to be without any kind of uh, illness or anything that was not purely perfect from uh, the way they could view these animals that were brought for sacrifice. God saying, I deserve, I demand the very best to have first place in your life. Somebody has said, well, <clears throat> you know, I'm not too bad. Uh, I'm better than average, I would say. <clears throat> Another man has defined average as being the best of the worst and the worst of the best. <clears throat> You've heard some people say, perhaps, well, I know that I don't give a full tithe, but neither does my brother. Or somebody else says, I don't read the Bible as much as I should, but I read it more than my wife. You know, sometimes we will use other people as our standard, but the Bible tells us very clearly that God the Father is conforming us to the image of His Son, Jesus. And so our standard is not someone else, but it is to be Christ Himself. Jesus who gave Himself, gave His all for the glory of God the Father. It is He who is our standard. And so we need to consider what it truly means to give God first place in our life. Well, according to this passage of Scripture, I believe Abraham was such a man. And first of all, if we're going to give God first place, we must always be available to God. Abraham here in this text, at least twice, when God called him by name, Abraham said, here am I. He was available to God at all times. Uh, whether we're in the classroom, uh, whether we're in the checkout check counter at Walmart, or wherever it might be, God is the same God there as He is in worship on Sunday. He's the same God that was there uh, giving us His salvation through His Son Jesus. He is the same God today and wherever we go as He is in this sanctuary right here today. And so we must be available to God at all times if we are going to give Him first place. This reminds me of the story of little Samuel in 1 Samuel where uh, his mother Hannah had prayed for him for years and finally God gave her that child and she promised she would give him back to him. To, she would help him to serve God and so she took him to serve with preacher Eli. And uh, so while he was there... Uh, in the night, God came to Samuel and called him by name. Incidentally, I want you to remember that God knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows what your circumstance is. And He is the same God there, wherever you might find yourself. And so he called him by name. Samuel, never having heard that voice like that before, perhaps, he went to preacher Eli and he said, You called me. Eli said, son, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. And so the voice of God comes the second time. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel uh, gets up and he goes back to Eli thinking it's that, that priest. And uh, he says, you called me. And uh, uh, he said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. This happened three times. And I know that Eli might have been a Baptist preacher like me because he was a little slow to figure out God was in this thing. And the third time he said, Well, Samuel, when you go back and lie down this time, when you hear the voice, you speak and say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Well, he went back. He was available to God. And when God called him by name, he said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He was available to God, and you and I should be at all times. I truly believe that oftentimes I myself have missed opportunities that God had placed in my way that I could have somehow helped someone 
or given glory to Jesus Christ uh, through something if I had just been available to God without being distracted. I know that in this modern day, uh, our computers and our games and all of those things, uh, our iPhones and iPads keep us distracted. I was uh, driving in East Tennessee while we were in on furlough a couple years ago, and this young guy drove by us. His mirror on the passenger side hit my mirror on the driver's side and cracked it, and it was moving around. I, I followed this guy, blowing my horn, flashing my lights for about 12 miles before I got his attention. You know what he was doing? He was slumped down into the seat, talking on his cell phone. He never knew that he hit my car. And when I finally got him pulled over, I told him, please don't talk on that thing while you're driving uh, because he was distracted. And if we're going to give God first place, we need to have our antenna tuned in to the voice of God at every moment. No matter where we are, what we're doing, listening, being available to God. Years ago, when I was a youth minister in a church in South Dallas, the secretary of the church one day said, Stephen, did I ever tell you the story about my daughter who is in your youth group? I said, well, Peggy, you didn't, but I'd love to hear it. And she said, well, my husband and I, when we got married, we had talked about how much we love children. We wanted to have uh, several. And she said, uh, when we had our first child, it was a little boy. She said, he was the joy of our life. We were so excited, and we just enjoyed him so much. And she said, one day after about six months into his life, she said, I went in to pull back the blanket as I did every afternoon after his nap, and I was going to attend to his needs. She said, I looked down. She said, my baby's face was blue. She said, I put my hand on his chest. He was cold. And she said, I I picked him up, and I tried tried to shake him just a little bit to see if he would move. She said, but my baby was not able to move because my baby had already died there in that bed. She said, we were thrown into deepest despair. She said, we talked to the doctors. They could not explain it, how that child died of crib death. The doctor said, we don't know why it happens, but it happens sometimes. She said, I was so depressed, and so was my husband. She said, we decided we never wanted to have another child again because we did not want this kind of pain. She said it was something like I had never had experienced in my life. But she said, God in His wisdom, one day I found that He had allowed me to be with child again. And she said, we were as careful as we could be. She said, we took every precaution. She said, that little girl that was born is that girl that's in your youth group. She said, when I brought her home from the hospital, she said, I pulled her little bed up next to my bed in the bedroom, and I put my hand over on her chest, and I wanted to know if her breathing pattern changed, even for a moment. I was up in a flash. I was attending to that child. Dear brother or sister in Christ, let me suggest that if the love of a mother for her child will make her so available that she has her hand upon the chest of that child so that at any hour of the night she may be available to that child, should we not be as available to the Holy Spirit of God when His breathing changes, when He moves us in a direction, we should be available to God. And so she said, I was available at all times. There was a story told at Southwestern Theological Seminary. Uh, It became legendary. The preaching, one of those preaching uh, professors had had his class assigned to come and preach a sermon. All of them were to prepare a 10-minute sermon on the Good Samaritan. And they were to come to that class on a certain day it was to begin, and they were to preach Uh, on that text about the Good Samaritan. Uh, 
that helped this man on the road. And so, on their way to the class that day, the professor had three people stationed at strategic places who were pretending to have very dire needs. Not one of those people who passed by those people in need did what the Good Samaritan said. They were not paying attention. They were not available. And that was part of their test. If we're going to give God first place, we must remain available to Him at all times. Uh, Secondly, if God is going to have first place in our life, we must obey God in everything. You'll notice here in this text that Abraham, going to do what was perhaps the most difficult thing in his life, to slay his son as an offering before God, he got up early in the morning and he started on his way. He did not not waver, he did not procrastinate, but he obeyed God immediately when he got the word from God. This reminds me in Matthew chapter 4, of the four men on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, You'll recall that, I'm sure, as Jesus was walking along. And uh, Simon and Andrew, fishermen there, Jesus called them. The Bible says that immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. And then a little further along, James and John did the very same thing. They obeyed immediately. It reminds me of these three Baptist women Uh, from the rural area of East Tennessee uh, who had gone to Chicago for a convention. They had never been out of their community their whole life, perhaps, and they were told during the orientation, be careful now because this is a dangerous city. Don't get out by yourself. Be sure that in certain parts of the city you just won't find yourself. And so uh, always be in a group. Well, one night, these three ladies, they sure enough found themselves, just the three of them, as they meandered through the city streets, scared to death. It was dark on the sides. Everything that moved scared them to death. And finally, after what seemed to them to be an eternity, they got back to that big hotel they were staying in, saw the big lighted foyer, and they walked in and breathed a sigh of relief. They walked over to the elevator and uh, punched the button. And uh, when the doors opened up, their biggest nightmare was standing there. This big old tall guy, he was tattooed from here to there. He was pierced. Uh, He had a hairdo that didn't really look like hair. And he had on the side of his leg uh, one of the biggest daggers they'd ever seen in their lives. And to make matters worse, there was a huge huge Doberman pincher dog standing next to him, had teeth that looked like they were nine feet long, shining and glistening, and the dog looked like he was just uh, giving them a scowl. Well, he was just standing there. Well, the ladies looked at one another, and one of them uh, said under her breath, well, uh, you know, the, uh, the speaker at the conference tonight did talk about how God uh, uh, helped David to slay the giant. Surely he can help us get on this elevator. And one of the other girls said, no, 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 no. That was David. And the third one said, look, ladies, we got to get on this elevator. Uh, let's, let's get on here. Let's just ask God to help us. And so finally the other two acquiesced. They got on the elevator They turned around with that dog standing behind them and that big guy that looked like he was dangerous. The doors closed. They pushed the button to the floor they wanted to go to and suddenly it jerked and the elevator started up. Well, somewhere between second and third floor, that man said, sit! And all four of them sat down. That's the kind of obedience that God deserves from us. An immediate obedience. Anywhere, everywhere to obey Him is always the very best. I shall never forget being in the uh, evangelism class 
at Southwestern Seminary with one of the most godly men I'd ever known, Dr. Roy Fish. He brought uh, uh, Terry Bryant from Lakeland, Florida, a young pastor, into that class. And Dr. Fish said, I want you to listen to Pastor Bryant as he tells you what's happening in his church. He said, folks, a lot of people won't believe it, but God's working so powerfully in our church. He said, it's a new church. We just have been, God has just overrun the community with His Spirit. And he said, people are getting saved. We drive through the community and we'll go out to someone's pool and we'll baptize. He said, uh, last time we baptized, I think it was 17 people they had baptized. He said, uh, he said it was just a great testimony to what God was doing in their church. He said a couple weeks later, one of the members of our church that had only been saved a couple of weeks called me up. He was weeping. He said, Pastor, could I come and talk to you? I need to tell you what's happened. And the pastor said, well, yes, come on over. And so he did. He said he was sitting across from me, and the tears flowed down his cheeks as he said, Pastor, you know, I, I was a soldier in Vietnam. He said, I was sitting on my uh, sofa the other night, and he said, I just felt a voice within me saying, get up and go outside. He said, I thought I was maybe having flashbacks, but he, he said, I thought, well, well, what can I lose? And so he said, I got up and I walked through the front door into the front yard. And he said, the voice said, go back to the backyard. He said, I turned and started toward the backyard. He said, the voice said, start running. He said, I thought by this time I'm crazy. But he said, I started running. And he said, I was going to run right into the water, into the lake behind our house. But he said, no, uh, the voice said, you run onto the pier and you run out to the end of it and you jump out as far as you can. And he said, I did that and when I fell into that lake, he said, my right hand lit on something. And he said, when I looked over, I, I, was, I was shocked to see it was the face of my seven-year-old boy. He was going down for the last time. He said, that man began to weep profusely and he said, Pastor, I now know that that was the Holy Spirit. He said, I hate to think what would have happened had I not been obedient to the voice of God. I was on an airplane coming back from Dallas, Texas one time as I was studying at Southwestern. I'd been asked to preach a revival in Oak, um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And we were in the plane, I guess we were at about 35,000 feet, flying along, and a lady was sitting to my left at the window, and on the right, uh, on the aisle, was a, um, an atomic scientist from Oak Ridge. Well, uh, I struck up a conversation with the lady. She was very friendly, and she had told the story how she was coming from California to visit her sister and how she had been flying was very tired so momentarily she leaned back and put her head against the seat very distinctly very clearly God said in my heart Stephen I want you to tell that woman how to get saved well being the uh, theolog theology student I was and coming back to preach a revival I did the spiritual thing I just Questioned God. I said, well, God, uh, didn't you hear what she said? She's tired. She's not going to want to hear this. And besides, these people around here, they don't want to be disturbed either. And then, very clearly, the Holy Spirit said to me, Stephen, are you the Lord or is Jesus? Well, I, I argued uh, another sentence or two. And finally, I said, Lord, I'm not Lord, but you are. So I turned and I put my hand up on her, her wrist. She opened her eyes and looked at me. I said, ma'am, this may sound strange to you, but I have been definitely prompted by God to tell you how you may know for sure that when you depart this life, 
you will be with God for eternity. Her eyes got wide, and suddenly tears burst out and ran down, one after the other, making one track on each side. She looked at me and said, About two weeks ago, a cousin of mine called me, and she told me how that she had somehow gotten saved, I think she called it, said she got right with God through Jesus Christ. And she suggested I should do the same. And she said, for these weeks now, I have told God, if it's true, please send somebody to tell me how I can be saved. And somewhere about 22,000 feet above the clouds of Memphis, Tennessee, as we descended to land in that city, Helen Simmons, gave her life to Jesus Christ. If we're going to give God first place in our life, we must be always available. We must always obey immediately what our Lord says. But thirdly, and I must hurry, we must trust God unconditionally. The Bible says here that Abraham tells his young men who were with him, You stay here, but I and my son are going to worship and will come again to you. Grammatically, what he is saying is, my son and I are the subjects there in that sentence. We are going there and coming again. Abraham trusted God unconditionally that if he required him to take the life of his son, that he would return him to him. He trusted God unconditionally. Reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, three men, three Hebrew men, who were told by Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't bow down to my idol, I'll throw you into the fiery furnace. Do you recall their answer? Without even batting an eye, they said, O king, we're not careful in answering you. We don't even have to think about it. Our God can deliver us out of your fiery furnace, but even if not, we will still not bow down to your God. Should we not, as children of God, also have an even if not in our daily life? To trust God unconditionally, regardless of how things appear, When I was studying at Southwestern, I would drive for about three quarters of an hour to school. I was driving a little Toyota GT, and uh, we were serving in a little church in South Dallas, and I had been called in by the finance committee, and two of the women on that committee began to cry. And they said, Stephen, you've done a great job this year as a youth minister. That's one reason I'm telling you this story, because I did such a great job. I'm just teasing. But they said, we don't have the money to give you a raise this year. One of those ladies looked up, almost sobbing, and she said, we know, Stephen, that your first baby has just been born. We know that you have needs. Tell you the truth, we had many months that we had too much month left at the end of the money. We sold everything that was not essential to us. We sold the television. We sold other things that were not nailed down. We even made homemade Christmas ornaments to sell at a bazaar in order to raise enough money. My wife said one day as she wept, Stephen, there are people in this city going on cruises, but this week I couldn't buy a stick of meat. We ate a lot of beans. We shared meals with other students. That little Toyota Celica that I was driving, that week I could hear something clicking when I pulled up to stop at the stop signs or red lights. When I got home and I looked at those tires, literally, 
some of the steel belts you could see coming through that rubber. I said, honey, God's going to provide for us. She said, what are you going to do? Now, I'm not recommending this, okay? Don't put God to the test. But I felt to do this, I said, I'm going to go buy new tires and write a check. She said, we don't have the money. I said, what? She said, we don't have any money in that account hardly, just enough to keep it open. She said, that check will bounce all the way to Arkansas. I said, well, maybe somebody will catch it and give us the money for it. Well, that was on uh, Saturday. That Monday, I went and got the new tires. Uh, They were $346 and some odd cents. Drove back home, and Susan was wringing her hands. Again, I'm not recommending this, but here's what happened. That Tuesday morning, the very next morning, I went out to get in that Celica, and I saw out of the corner of my eye an envelope sticking out of our mailbox that was up on the wall of our house next to the door. I went over and pulled it out. I took it in. The house, it was a cashier's check that looked like I had gotten it for myself. Whoever got it for us didn't want us to know that they had bought it for us. I found out later it was a lost man who lived directly next door. He was an attorney. He went to his wife that day and said, Honey, I don't know why, but I just feel impressed to give that little Baptist preacher over here a gift. Do you mind if I do that? And she, being a Christian, said, Well, no, I'm not opposed to it at all. It was a cashier's check in the amount of $500. I went into the bedroom and I I showed my wife and and she was uh, dancing up and down and we were about to break the bed. The manufacturer didn't recommend it, but we were dancing on that bed. And, uh, And we were just praising God and thanking Him. The very next week, I had visited in the hospital and this, this lady that I had, did not know until the hospital asked me if I would witness to her daughter who was in there as a patient. And she said, uh, she uh, is not a Christian. Would you tell her how to be saved? I said, I'd be happy to. So I went in there and spoke with her. She said, do you have a business card? I said, yes. I gave her the card and left. So the next week, I got another check in the mail from this lady. And here's what her note said. As I was praying, God laid you on my heart and said, you have needs, and he wanted me to send you this gift. It was a check in the amount of $500. Well, we, we did another Baptist dance right there in the living room this time. By this time, my wife is beginning to believe that God's going to meet our needs. In the next week or so, in order for God, it seemed like he wanted to nail it down strongly we got a note from some friends who lived 965 miles away. It was a note that said almost exactly what the note had said from this dear woman. Stephen and Susan, as my wife and I were praying this morning, God laid it upon our heart to send you this gift. It was a check in the amount of $500. In those three gifts, we got much more than I would have gotten in a raise from that little Baptist church. What am I saying? Trust God unconditionally. He will meet your need. Everyone is called to be saved and everyone called to give God first place. I hope you'll always do that. And trust me, life is going on and there is a life after school. Trust God, be available, and obey Him. Would you please stand? Our Father, we pray in this moment
that you may help each of us to truly allow you to be in first place of our lives. Father, in every moment, in every situation, every day, oh God, perhaps there's someone here today who would say, I need to move some things aside and give God his rightful place. Father, give your grace and your help in doing that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.